Hello and welcome to another in a series of lectures on United States history. This will be lecture 12. All right, so let's get into it. Sectional tensions were strained by 1852 and later by another phenomenon that has to do with Harriet Beecher Stowe. The mother of a half dozen children, she published her famous novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Dismayed by the patch, passage of the Fugitive Slave Law, she was determined to awaken the North to the wickedness of slavery by laying bare its terrible inhumanity, especially the cruel splitting of families. Her wildly popular book relied on powerful imagery and touching pathos. She explained that God had written it. The success of the novel at home and abroad was sensational. Several hundred thousand copies were published in the first year, and the totals soon ran into the millions as the tale was translated into more than a dozen different languages. It was also put on the stage for lengthy runs. No other novel in American history, perhaps in all history, can be compared with it as a political force. Uh, there's even a film version of it on YouTube if you want to uh, take a look at that. When Mrs. Stowe was introduced to President Lincoln in 1862, he reportedly remarked, perhaps humorously, quote, So you're the little woman who wrote the book that made this great war. Unquote. The truth is, however, that Uncle Tom's Cabin, while it did help in the start of the Civil War, and it may even have helped to win it as well, the South, on the other hand, condemned that vile wretch in petticoats, as they referred to her as, when it learned that hundreds of thousands of fellow Americans were reading and believing her what they referred to as unfair indictments. Mrs. Stowe had never witnessed slavery at first hand in the Deep South, but she had seen it briefly during a visit to Kentucky, and she had lived for many years in Ohio, a center of underground railway activity. Uncle Tom left profound impression on the North. Uncounted thousands of readers swore that henceforth they would have nothing to do with the enforcement of the fugitive slave law. The tale was devoured by millions of impressionable youths in the 1850s. The later Boys in Blue, who volunteered to fight the Civil War through to its firm finale, have many memories of a beaten and dying Uncle Tom that will help to sustain them during the long Civil War. The novel was immensely popular abroad, especially in England and France. Countless readers wept over the kindly Tom and the angelic Ava, while deploring the brutal Simon Legree. When the guns in America finally began to boom, the common people of England sensed that the triumph of the North would spell the end of the curse of slavery in America. The governments in London and Paris seriously considered intervening on behalf of the South, but they were sobered by the realization that many of their own people, aroused by what was sometimes referred to as Tom mania, that the people in their own countries might not support them in their actions. Another trouble-brewing book appeared in 1857, five years after the debut of Uncle Tom. Entitled The Impending Crisis of the South, it was written by Horatio Helper. A 
non-aristocratic uh, individual from North Carolina, hating both slavery and blacks, he attempted to prove by an array of statistics that indirectly the non-slaveholding whites were the ones who suffered most from the millstone of slavery. Unable to secure a publisher in the South, he finally managed to find one in the North. Helper's influence was um, relatively unread by most of the poor whites in the South to whom his message was generally directed towards. His book, with its illusions, the South would proclaim, was banned in the South, where book-burning parties were held. But in the North, thousands of copies, many in condensed form, were distributed as campaign literature by the Republicans. Southerners were further embittered when they learned that their northern brethren were spreading these wicked lies. Thus did Southerners, reacting much as they did to Uncle Tom's cabin, became increasingly unwilling to sleep under the same federal roof with their hostile Yankee bedfellows. The rolling plains of Kansas had meanwhile been providing a horrible example of the workings of popular sovereignty, although admittedly under abnormal conditions. Newcomers who ventured into Kansas were a motley crew, not to be mistaken for the band. Most of the northerners were just ordinary westward-moving pioneers in search of richer lands beyond the sunset. But a small part of the inflow was financed by groups of northern abolitionists, or free soilers. The most famous of these anti-slavery organizations was the New England Immigrant Aid Company, which sent about 2,000 persons to the troubled area to keep the South out, shouting, Ho for Kansas! Many of them carried the deadly new breech-loading Sharps rifles, nicknamed Beecher's Bibles, after the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher, Harriet Beecher Stowe's brother, who had helped raise money for their purchase. Southern spokesmen, now more than ordinarily touchy, raised furious cries of betrayal. They had supported the Kansas-Nebraska scheme of Douglas with the informal understanding that Kansas would become slave and Nebraska free. A few southern hotheads, quick to respond in kind, attempted to assist small groups of well-armed slave owners in Kansas. But planting blacks on Kansas soil was a losing game. Slaves were valuable and volatile property, and foolish indeed were owners who would take them where bullets were flying and where the soil might be voted free under popular sovereignty. The census of 1860 found only two slaves among 107,000 people in the entire territory of Kansas, and only 15 in Nebraska. Crisis conditions in Kansas rapidly worsened. When the day came in 1855 to elect members of the first territorial legislature, pro-slavery border ruffians poured in from Missouri to vote early and often. The slavery supporters triumphed and then set up their own puppet government at Shawnee Mission. The Free Soilers, unable to stomach this conspiracy, established an extra-legal regime of their own in Topeka. The confused citizens of Kansas thus had to choose between what laws they were going to obey from whichever legislature passed them. Tensions mounted as settlers also feuded over conflicting land claims. The breaking point came in 1856, when a gang of pro-slavery raiders 
alleging provocation, shot up and burned a part of the free soil town of Lawrence. This outrage was but the prelude to a bloodier tragedy. The fanatical figure of John Brown now stalked through Kansas, gray-bearded, narrowly minded in a number of different ways. John Brown had failed at a number of enterprises in his life, until finally he had, in his own words, been given a mission from God to go to Kansas and ensure that it would be held in the hands of free people. And so, when he heard what had happened at Lawrence, John Brown will lead a group of his followers and family to find individuals that they believed were pro-slavery. They'll then lay hold of them and fiendishly beat them to death. Civil war in Kansas flared up as one side after the other took retribution for actions that the other side had done. This will continue until it eventually will merge with the Civil War. Altogether, the Kansas conflict will destroy millions of dollars worth of property and cost many lives. Yet by 1857, Kansas had enough people, chiefly free soilers, to apply for statehood on a popular sovereignty basis. The pro-slavery forces, then in charge, devised a tricky document known as the Lecompton Constitution. The people were not allowed to vote for or against the Constitution as a whole, but for the Constitution either with slavery or with no slavery. If they voted against slavery, one of the remaining provisions of the Constitution would protect the owners of slaves already in Kansas. So whatever the outcome, there would still be black slaves in Kansas. Many free soilers were infuriated by this, and they'll boycott the polls. So, left to themselves, those who were pro-slavery will outnumber those who were free soil, anti-slavery, and a constitution will be passed that will allow slavery. And that will then be sent off to Washington to be ratified. James Buchanan, now President of the United States, was a strong Southern supporter. His own political party, the Democratic Party, was also backing the movement for slavery. But other individuals, like Senator Douglas, who was a champion of popular sovereignty, looked at the situation in Canvas, Kansas and generally was unpleased since he believed that this was not true popular sovereignty. President Buchanan generally will be in something of a state of um, anxiety over exactly what to do with this situation. Individuals like Charles Sumner, senator from Massachusetts, will stand up before Congress and begin to denounce the actions that were taking place in Kansas. But his vitriol will be focused primarily upon those who were 
pro-slavery. He'll even go so far as to actually name specific individuals that he referred to as being the cause of much of the difficulties in Kansas. And he will describe these individuals in some very unflattering terms, so much so that one of the relatives of the individual that individuals that he will mention, uh, a representative from South Carolina by the name of Preston Brooks, will become so incensed by this that he will enter into the Senate chamber, find Charles Sumner, and then beat him until he was unconscious with his cane. As a result of this, newspapers across the country will reprint, uh, will reprint what had happened. And in the North, it was viewed as an outrageous attack. In the South, it was viewed as a gentleman standing up for the uh, honor of his family against the scurrilous attacks of a rabid cur. And a number of individuals in the South will send replacement canes for the one uh, that Preston Brooks had broken on the back of Charles Sumner. For Sumner, he will be so badly beaten that he will be unable to fulfill his duties in Congress and will have to spend a considerable amount of time recovering. But rather than replace him in the Senate, his home state of Massachusetts will keep his seat open as a visible reminder of what slavery did to people. Meanwhile, presidential elections, politics, will continue on. In 1856, we have, again, three political parties. And again, the third political party is there because neither political party was really going f as forcefully against slavery as some would want them to. So, the Democrats will choose as their candidate James uh, Buchanan. Tall for the time, about six feet. He often had his head cocked to one side because of a problem with one of his eyes. Buchanan himself, and indeed for uh, the Democratic Party, while it was essentially a southern pro-slavery party, and most understood this at the time, Buchanan himself was not exactly wholeheartedly behind the issue of slavery. He was rather mediocre in his stance the Republican Party, which will rise up from the ashes of the previous political party, will have as their first candidate John C. Fremont, the so-called Pathfinder of the West, a dashing but erratic explorer, soldier, surveyor, who is supposed to find the path to the White House. The Republican platform came out vigorously against the extension of slavery into the territories, but where it already existed in the established states, it favored the position of popular sovereignty. Which brings us to the third political party, that of the American Party. This was a political party that had become angry over the influx of foreigners into the United States, primarily 
uh, from Ireland and Germany. The American Party, also known as the Know Nothing Party, because of its secretiveness about its party platform, nominated ex-President Millard Fillmore. Mudslinging was a common activity during this political cycle. Buchanan was assailed because he was a bachelor. His uh, fiance had died after they had had a quarrel. So there was some rumor that maybe there was something wrong in her death. Fremont was reviled because of his illegitimate birth. Well, illegitimate for the time. His mother had left his father before he was born in order to run away with a French adventurer. But more striking to some people against Fremont was that he was also Roman Catholic. In the end, it's James Buchanan who will secure enough Electoral College votes to win, though he will lose the popular vote to John C. Fremont. It's during Buchanan's time as president, then, that we see a slow but steady march towards the events of the Civil War. The Dred Scott decision, handed down by the Supreme Court on March the 6th of 1857, abruptly ended the two-day presidential honeymoon after the unlucky bachelor uh, James Buchanan is elected. Basically, the case was simple. Dred Scott, a black slave, had lived with his master for five years in Illinois and Wisconsin Territory. Backed by interested abolitionists, he sued for freedom on the basis of his long residence on free soil. The Supreme Court proceeded to turn a simple legal case into a complex political issue. It ruled, not surprisingly, that Dred Scott was about was a black slave and not a citizen, and hence could not sue in federal courts. The tribunal could then have thrown out the case on these technical grounds alone. But a majority decided to go further. Under the leadership of Chief Justice Taney from the slave state of Maryland, a sweeping judgment on the larger issue of slavery in the territories seemed desirable, particularly to forestall arguments by two Free Soiler members who were preparing dissenting opinions. The pro-Southern majority evidently hoped in this way to lay the vexed question to rest. Taney's thunderclap rocked the Free Soilers back on their heels. A majority of the court decreed that because a slave was private property, he or she could be taken into any territory and legally held there in slavery. The reasoning was that the Fifth Amendment clearly forbade Congress to deprive persons of their property without due process of law. The court, to be consistent, went further. The Missouri Compromise, banning slavery north of 3630, had been repealed three years earlier by the Kansas-Nebraska Act, but its spirit was still venerated in the North. Now the court ruled that the Compromise of 1820 had been unconstitutional all along. Congress, regardless even of what the territorial legislatures themselves might want, a cry of delight broke from southern throats over this unexpected victory. 
champions of popular sovereignty were aghast, including Senator Douglas and a host of Northern Democrats. Another lethal wedge was thus driven between the northern and southern wings of the once unified Democratic Party. Foes of slavery extension, especially the Republicans, were infuriated by the Dred Scott setback. Their chief rallying cry had been the banishing of bondage from the territories. They now insisted that the ruling of the court was merely an opinion, not a decision, and no more binding than the views of a southern debating society. Republican defiance of the exalted tribunal was intensified by an awareness that a majority of its members were southerners, and by the conviction that it had debased itself by wallowing in the gutter of politics. Southerners, in turn, were inflamed by all this defiance. They began to wonder anew how much longer they could remain to a nation that refused to honor the Supreme Court, to say nothing of the constitutional compact that had established it. Bitterness caused by the Dred Scott decision was deepened by hard times, which dampened a period of feverish prosperity. Late in 1857, a panic burst about Buchanan's harassed head. The storm was not so bad economically as the Panic of 1837, but psychologically it was probably the worst of the 19th century. What caused the crash? Well, incoming gold from California played its part by helping to inflate the currency. The demands of the Crimean War had overstimulated the growing of grain, while frenzied speculation in land and railroads had further ripped the economic fabric. When the collapse came, over 5,000 businesses failed within a year. Unemployment, accompanied by hunger meetings in urban areas, was widespread. The North, including the grain growers, were hardest hit. The South, enjoying favorable cotton prices abroad, rode out the storm with flying colors. Panic conditions seemed further proof that cotton was king and that its economic kingdom was stronger than that of the North. This fatal delusion helped drive the overconfident Southerners closer to a shooting showdown. Financial distress in the North, especially in agriculture, gave a new vigor to the demand for free farms of 160 acres from the public domain. For several decades, interested groups had been urging the federal government to abandon its policy of selling the land for revenue. Instead, the argument ran, acreage should be given outright to the sturdy pioneers as a reward for risking health and life to develop it. A scheme to make outright gifts of homesteads encouraged two-pronged opposition. Eastern industrialists had long been unfriendly to free land. Some of them feared that their underpaid workers would be drained off to the West. The South was even more bitterly opposed, partly because slavery could not flourish on a mere 160 acres. Free farms would merely fill up the territories more rapidly with free soilers and further tip the political balance against the South. In 1860, after years of debate, Congress finally passed a Homestead Act, one that made public lands available at a nominal sum of 25 cents an acre. But it was stabbed to death by the pen of Buchanan. The Panic of 1857 also created a clamor for higher tariff rates. Several months before the crash, Congress, embarrassed by a large Treasury surplus, had enacted the Tariff of 1857. The new law, responding to pressures from the South, reduced duties to about 20%, the lowest point since the War of 1812. Hardly had the revised rates been placed on the books when financial distress descended. Northern manufacturers, many of them Republicans, noisily blamed their misfortunes 
on the low tariff. As the surplus melted away in the treasury, industrialists in the north pointed to the need for higher duties. But what really concerned them was their desire for increased protection. Thus the Panic of 1857 gave the Republicans two surefire economic issues for the election of 1860. Protection for the unprotected and farms for the farmless. The Illinois senatorial election of 1858 now claimed the national spotlight. Senator Douglas's term was about to expire, and the Republicans decided to run against him a rustic Springfield lawyer, Abraham Lincoln. The candidate, six foot four in height and 180 pounds in weight, presented an awkward but fascinating figure. Lincoln's legs, arms, and neck were exceptionally long. His head was crowned by coarse, black, and unruly hair, and his face was sad, sunken, and weather-beaten. Lincoln was no silver-spoon child of destiny. Born in 1809 in a Kentucky log cabin to impoverished parents, he attended a frontier school for not more than a year. Being an avid reader, he was mainly self-educated. All his life, he said, get and thar, rather than more proper English pronunciations. Though narrow-chested and somewhat stoop-shouldered, he shone in his frontier community as a wrestler and weightlifter, and spent some time, among other pioneering pursuits, as a splitter of logs for fence rails. A superb teller of amusing tales, he would oddly enough plunge into protracted periods of melancholy. Lincoln's private and professional life was not especially noteworthy. He married, as he said, above himself socially, into the influential Todd family of Kentucky, and the temperamental outbursts of his high-strung wife, known by her enemies as the She-Wolf, helped to school him in patience and forbearance. After reading a little law, he gradually emerged as one of the dozen or so better-known trial lawyers in Illinois. Although still accustomed to carrying important papers in his stoved pipe hat, he was widely referred to as Honest Abe, partly because he would refuse cases that he could not conscientiously defend. The rise of Lincoln as a political figure was less than rocket-like. After making his mark in the Illinois legislature as a Whig politician, he served one undistinguished term in Congress. Until 1854, when he was 45 years of age, he had done nothing to establish a claim to being a true statesman. But the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act in that year lighted within him an unexpected fire. After mounting the Republican bandwagon, he emerged as one of the foremost politicians and orators of the Northwest. At the Philadelphia Convention of 1856, when John Fremont was nominated, Lincoln actually received a number of votes for the vice presidential nomination. Lincoln, as Republican nominee for the Senate seat, boldly challenged Douglas to a series of debates. This was a rash act, because the stumpy senator was probably the nation's most devastating debater. Douglas promptly accepted the challenge, and seven meetings were arranged between August and October of 1858. At first glance, the two contestants seemed ill-matched. The well-groomed and polished Douglas with stocky frame and bullish voice, presented a striking contrast to the lanky Lincoln with his baggy clothes and unshined shoes. Moreover, old Abe, as he was called in both affection and derision, had a piercing, high-pitched voice and was often ill at ease when he began to speak. But as he threw himself into an argument, he seemed to grow in height, while his Glowing eyes lighted up a rugged face. He relied on logic rather than on table-thumping. 
The most famous of the debates came at Freeport, Illinois, where Lincoln nearly impaled his opponent on the horns of a dilemma. Suppose, he queried, the people of a territory should vote slavery down. The Supreme Court in the Dred Scott decision had decreed that they could not. Who would prevail, the court or the people? Legend to the contrary, Douglas and some Southerners had already publicly answered the Fremont, uh, Freeport question. The little giant, as Douglas was sometimes known as, therefore did not hesitate to meet the issue head on. He replied that no matter how the Supreme Court had ruled, slavery would not be allowed if the people voted it down. Laws to protect slavery would have to be passed by the territorial legislatures. These would not be forthcoming in the absence of popular approval, and black slavery would soon disappear. Douglas, in truth, had American history on his side, where public opinion does not support the federal government, as in the case of Jefferson's embargo, the law is almost impossible to enforce. The upshot was that Douglas defeated Lincoln for the Senate seat. The little giant's loyalty to popular sovereignty, which still had a powerful appeal in Illinois, probably was the decisive factor. Senators were then chosen by state legislatures, and in the general election that followed the debates, more pro-Douglas members were elected than pro-Lincoln members. Yet, thanks to inequitable apportionment, the districts carried by Douglas's supporters represented a smaller population than those carried by the Lincoln supporters. Lincoln thus won a moral victory. Lincoln possibly was playing for larger stakes than just the senatorship. Although defeated, he had shambled into the national limelight in company with the most prominent northern politicians. Newspapers in the East published accounts of the debates, and Lincoln began to emerge as a potential Republican nominee for president. But Douglas, in willing Illinois, hurt his chances of winning the presidency, while further splitting his own political party. After his opposition to the Kansas Constitution and his further defiance of the Supreme Court at Freeport, Southern Democrats were determined to break up the party and the Union rather than accept him. The Lincoln-Douglas debate platform thus proved to be one of the preliminary battlefields of the Civil War. And now we come to John Brown. John Brown, who claimed that he was given messages from God, that he was told to do certain things, came up with a scheme to eradicate slavery in the South. His plan was to break into a uh, weapons depository, steal the weapons there, and hand them out to slaves in the South who would then rise up and murder their owners, men, women, and children. But his plan will fail when at Harper's Ferry, the townsfolk will stand up against John Brown, including freed blacks, one of which will die during this altercation, And they'll hold off John Brown long enough for the military to arrive, and John Brown will be arrested, tried and convicted, and later hanged. However, accounts of John Brown's life and his actions will be uh, radically different. In northern newspapers, he was viewed almost as a Christ-like figure, giving his life for others. In the south, on the other hand, 
they were shocked that anyone could support such an individual, a man who advocated the murder of men, women, and children. Thus, this helped to create a greater divide between the North and the South. Without question, the presidential election of 1860 was the most fateful in American history. On it hung the issue of peace or civil war. Deeply divided, the Democrats met at Charleston, South Carolina, where Douglas, the leading candidate of the northern wing of the party, waited to be crowned. But the southern fire eaters regarded him as a traitor. As a result of his unpopular stand on the Kansas Constitution and his debate at Freeport. After a bitter wrangle over the platform, the delegates from most of the cotton states walked out. When the remainder could not scrap together the necessar uh, nece necessary <laughs> two thirds vote for Douglas, the entire body dissolved in confusion. The first tragic session was the secession of Southerners from the Democratic National Convention. The Democrats tried again in Baltimore. This time, the Douglas Democrats, chiefly from the North, were firmly in the saddle. Many of the Southern state delegates again walked out of the convention. But the rest of the convention enthusiastically nominated Douglas as their candidate and the platform that they will create comes out squarely for popular sovereignty. Angered Southern Democrats promptly organized a rival convention in Baltimore, in which many of the northern states were not represented. They selected as their leader the Vice President John C. Breckinridge, a man of moderate views from the border state of Kentucky, and the, their platform favored the extension of slavery into the territories and the annexation of slave-populated Cuba. A middle-of-the-road group, fearing for the Union, hastily organized the Constitutional Union Party, sneered at as the do-nothing, or sometimes as the Old Gentleman's Party, it consisted mainly of former Whigs and know nothings Desperately anxious to elect a compromise candidate, they met in Baltimore and nominated for the presidency John Bell of Tennessee. And they went through the streets ringing handbells in support of their candidate. Elated Republicans were presented with a heaven-sent opportunity. Sensing victory in the breeze as their opponents split hopelessly, they gathered in Chicago in a huge, box-like wooden structure called the Wigwam. William Seward was by far the best known of the candidates, but his radical views had fatally injured his prospects. His numerous enemies coined the slogan, Success, rather than Seward. Lincoln, the favorite son of Illinois, was definitely a second choice, but he was a stronger candidate because he had made fewer enemies. Overtaking Seward on the third ballot, he was nominated amid scenes of the wild excitement. The Republican platform had a seductive appeal for just about every important non-Southern group. For the Free Soilers, they advocated non-extension of slavery. For the Northern manufacturers, they proposed a protective tariff. For the immigrants, no abridgment of rights. For the Northwest, a Pacific Railroad. For the West, internal improvements at federal expense. And for the farmers, free homesteads from the public domain. Seductive slogans were, Vote yourselves a farm, and land for the landless. 
Southern secessionists promptly served notice that the election of Lincoln would split the Union. In fact, Honest Abe, though hating slavery, wasn't an outright abolitionist. But he saw fit, perhaps mistakenly, to issue no statements to quiet Southern fears. He had already put himself on record, and fresh statements might stir up fresh antagonisms. The returns breathlessly awaited proclaimed a sweeping victory for Lincoln, mainly because the Democratic vote was split between Douglas and Breckinridge. Had the Democratic Party managed to come together and unite under one candidate, they would likely have won the election, and who knows might have, what might have happened in that case. A tragic chain reaction of secession now began to explode. South Carolina, which had threatened to go out if the sectional Lincoln came in, was as good as its word. Four days after the election of Lincoln, its legislature voted unanimously to call a special convention. Meeting at Charleston in December of 1860, it unanimously voted to secede. During the next six weeks, six other states of the Lower South, though somewhat less united, followed South Carolina over the precipice. Four more were to join later, bringing the total to eleven. With the eyes of destiny upon them, the seven seceders, formally meeting at Montgomery, Alabama, created a government known as the Confederate States of America. As their president, they chose Jefferson Davis, a dignified and austere recent member of the United States Senate from Mississippi. It graduated from West Point, was a former cabinet member, had a wide military and administrative experience, but he suffered from chronic ill health as well as from a frustration of uh, his inability to be a Napoleon of America. The crisis, already critical enough, was deepened by the lame duck interlude. Lincoln though elected president in November of 1860, could not take office until four months later. During this period of protracted uncertainty, when he was still a private citizen in Illinois, seven of the eleven uh, seceding states will pull out of the Union. President Buchanan, the aging incumbent, had been, has been blamed for not holding the seceders in the Union by sheer force. Never a vigorous man and habitually conservative, he was now nearly 70, and although devoted to the Union, he was surrounded by pro-Southern advisers. As an able bachelor lawyer wedded to the Constitution, he did not believe that the Southern states could legally secede, yet he could find no authority in the Constitution for stopping them using military force. Impending bloodshed spurred final and frantic attempts at compromise. The most promising of these efforts was sponsored by Senator Crittenden of Kentucky, on whose shoulders had fallen the mantle of a fellow Kentuckian, Henry Clay. The proposed Crittenden amendments to the Constitution were designed to appease the South. Slavery in the territories was to be prohibited north of 3630, but south of that line, it was to be given federal protection in all territories existing, or to be acquired in the future. Further states, north or south of 3630, could come into the Union with or without slavery, as they should choose. In short, the slavery supporters were to be guaranteed full rights in the southern territories, as long as they were territories, regardless of the wishes of the majority under popular sovereignty. Federal protection in the territory south of 3630 might conceivably, though improbably, turn the entire area permanently to slavery. 
Lincoln flatly rejected the Crittenden scheme, which offered some slight prospect of success, and all hope of compromise fled. For this refusal he must bear a heavy responsibility. Yet he had been elected on a platform that opposed the extension of slavery, and he felt that as a matter of principle he could not afford to yield, even though gains for slavery in the territories might be only temporary. Larger gains might come later in Cuba and Mexico. Crittenden's proposal, said Lincoln, quote, would amount to a perpetual covenant of war against every people, tribe, and state owning a foot of land between here and Tierra del Fuego, unquote. As for the supposedly spineless Buchanan, how could he have prevented the civil war by starting a civil war? No one has yet come up with a satisfactory answer. If he had used force on South Carolina in December of 1860, the fighting almost certainly would have erupted three months sooner than it did, and under less favorable circumstances for the Union. The North would have appeared as the heavy-handed aggressor, and the crucial border states, so vital to the Union, would probably have been driven into the arms of the seceding states. One reason why the Crittenden Compromise failed in December of 1860 was the prevalence of an attitude reflected in a private letter of Senator Hammond of South Carolina. Quote, I firmly believe that the slave-holding South is now the controlling power of the world, that no other power would force us, uh, would face us in hostility. Cotton, rice, tobacco, and naval stores command the world, and we have sense to know it and are sufficiently Teutonic to carry it out successfully. The North without us would be a motherless calf, bleeding about, and die of mange and starvation. Unquote. The South leaves essentially for slavery, at least in modern minds. But there were other considerations that Southerners had for why it was that they wanted to leave a Union that they had been in for all of their lives. Southerners saw, for example, that politically, as the population increased in the North and in the Western areas, the South would have less and less say in the federal government. And the Republican win was a direct threat, they believed, to their rights as slaveholders. It could mean that they could lose everything. Economically, they would be devastated. Their lives, at least economically, would be over. Southerners were also tired of being criticized about their way of life. Nobody likes to be nagged at especially when many Southerners were very uh, upset about the practice itself. Many of them considered it an evil, but a necessary evil. They didn't want slavery to continue, but they couldn't see any other way of growing cotton. Machines at that time weren't able to pick the cotton, plant the cotton, but that meant therefore that it had to be done by hand and it would be profitable only if you could find inexpensive labor. And they believed that, rightly or wrongly, slave labor was the cheapest labor available. They also believed that because the North was so furious over slavery and their way of life in the South, that there wouldn't be any real opposition to it anyway. The North would be happy to let them go. And there were also those who believed that once they had freed themselves from the North, they could then set about 
building their own economy up even more, rather than just being a cotton-growing agricultural region. They could become a powerhouse. They could build their own cotton mills. They could build their own shipping industries. They could build their own banks, not have to rely for all of that from the north. Thus, more jobs would be created in their own areas. And throughout the world at this time, there were a number of movements towards creating new nation states. Germany and Italy, for example, were moving towards unification. So why not the South? Why shouldn't the South create a nation-state by the South for the South? And of course, and of course, many will also leave because they viewed a federal type of government to be overly oppressive to the state governments. And so they will prefer a confederacy over that of a um, federation. As we enter into the war, we should take a look at the balance of forces for both the North and the South. And as we do, you will notice that all of those strengths that the South felt that it had at the beginning will be either illusionary or, over time, will fade away. Hence the reason why the South loses. At the beginning, and indeed until the end, the South really only has to fight a defensive battle. They don't have to invade the North. They don't have to take northern cities. All they have to do is keep the North out of the South. And eventually, the North will grow tired of the fighting, the expense, and they will sue for peace. So the South didn't have to win. All they had to do was hold off the North. The South also, in the beginning, believed that they had a moral advantage in this fight. Most of those who are going to fight in the South do not fight because of slavery. In their minds, they were fighting for states' rights over that of the central government, the federal government. They believed that wholeheartedly. However, Later, politicians in the North, like Lincoln, will make this exclusively about the issue of slavery. And when that begins to happen, the South will lose its moral advantage. And even Southerners fighting in the Civil War will become a little demoralized over this. Were they really fighting to keep people in bondage, in slavery. And that will weaken their resolve a bit. At the beginning, the South will also have the best military officers. Individuals like Robert E. Lee, who had a long, illustrious military career, was the head of West Point at one point will decide that his allegiance lay with his state rather than with the federal government. And that's the way most people felt in the South at the time. They owed their allegiance first to their state and second to their nation. And hence, when their nation, I'm sorry, when their state seceded, even though they had misgivings and were themselves not in favor of the issue of slavery. Remember, most people in the South, the vast majority of the people in the South, didn't own any slaves, or they might own one or two, perhaps. But 
what they believed they were fighting for was the issue of who had the final authority, who had the real power, the states or the federal government. So individuals will leave the Union when their states leave. And most Southerners had, for generations, sent their sons off to military school to become lifelong career officers in the United States military. So in the beginning, the North is bereft of a great deal of uh, good leadership militarily. But over time, because the Civil War doesn't last a year or two, the North will gain experience in fighting until eventually they will have commanders who have the experience to go up against individuals like Robert E. Lee. Southerners themselves were uh, quite a rugged, individualistic kind of group. Most of them lived on small farms and were used to going out into the wild and hunting for game to bring home for food. And so when they went off to war, they went off to war with high hopes, high ideals. They weren't fighting for the issue of slavery in their mind. They were fighting for the ideal of states' rights. And that was exemplified in battle, when the rebels would give out a powerful yell that brought chills to northern soldiers when they heard it. And you can still hear the rebel yell today. You can go on YouTube. There are videos uh, that were made in the 1930s of individuals who had fought in the Civil War and were still alive. And they will present what uh, they referred to as the rebel yell. So you can hear it today if you want to. And often I will play that in class as well. But again, I can't do that in this format. Next, while the South itself doesn't have the North's factory system in place yet. Eventually, it will build its own ironworks, its own munitions factories, its own military infrastructure. But to overcome that problem, at first they will seize weapons from federal arms depositories where the federal government had positioned weapons within each of the states in case they should uh, need them for invasion from foreign nations. So those weapons will be there for the Southerners until eventually they'll be able to uh, create manufacturing facilities to make their own weapons, their own munitions, their own uniforms, their own military equipment. But the problem, of course, is that while they'll be able to do that, and the South will be able to produce enough weapons and munitions and uniforms for, and shoes for their soldiers, they don't have the infrastructure to be able to get those out to their soldiers on the field of battle. They don't have uh, a good road system. They don't have railroads in large numbers as they do in the north and in the west. And as a result, uh, by the end of the war, southern soldiers, though they might win a temporary uh, battle, will not be able to take advantage of that victory because many of their soldiers will stop and loot the dead for their shoes, for their weapons, their ammunition, for food. So even though the South is an agricultural region and they can grow enough food to feed all of their troops, 
that food won't be able to get to the soldiers for the most part. And the South will thus have an enormous difficulty in logistics, in uh, transferring war needed materials for the war to its soldiers. And this is one of their largest problems. Another is the illusion of King Cotton. Before the war, Southerners believed that if the North were to make war on the South, that they would be making war against themselves. Because if war came, cotton production would come to a halt. Cotton fueled the northern factories. And without the northern factories and the people working in them, the northern economy would collapse. And they would be hurting themselves in the process. But as it will turn out, the cotton production over the previous few years before the Civil War had been major crop production. And a lot of cotton had thus been warehoused in the North and in places like England. So for a while, they don't need southern cotton. And once they realize that the war is going to last for a while, they will find other sources of cotton, like uh, cotton from uh, Egypt, though not as good of quality as that from the southern region of the United States. Nonetheless, it's far preferable to have the lesser quality cotton from Egypt than to get into a fight with the United States. And so we come to the last of the nails in the coffin for the South. And that is foreign assistance. The South had believed that the rest of Europe, primarily England and France, would come to their rescue. That they would do so because they needed southern cotton, but also because they would want to weaken a growing United States so that they would have a weaker rival. But that aid and assistance will not come, and it will not come for a variety of reasons. The North, on the other hand, will have a production of sufficient food to feed its troops, sufficient factories to manufacture weapons, munitions, clothing, shoes, all the necessities of war at the outset. And as the war progresses, they will only get better at doing it. Numerically, the North also had a much larger population to draw from for its military. The North and Western states had a population of some 22 million, while the South had a population of only 9 million, about a third of which were slaves, and until the very end of the Civil War, slaves were not used in the fighting. Another advantage that the North will have will be the great influx from Europe. During this period of time, nearly a million people will arrive, and they will all come to the North as the Navy of the North will close off the southern harbors to foreign trade. And many of those individuals will, for a variety of reasons, including bonus money, a very good bonus money for people who will join up volunteer for the Union Army, as well as a quicker road to citizenship, will join into the military. In fact, by the end of the Civil War, about 20% of the Union forces were 
foreign born. And of course, while it is that at the outset, beginning of the Civil War, the North doesn't have anywhere near as many or as capable of military commanders as the South. Nonetheless, as the war progresses, as it moves on one year, two years, three, the North will gain knowledge. And um, with that, their commanders will become better until they become the equal of the Southern military commanders. Another big advantage is that the North has an infrastructure. It has roads, railroads, bridges, all of these types of things that will enable the transportation and movement of not only war materials, food, clothing, weapons, but also men as well, and horses, artillery. The Battle of Gettysburg, for example, is won mostly because Gettysburg is near a railroad junction where the North could bring in at a far faster pace men and material into the area and thus they are able to win out against the South. And of course we shouldn't discount the influence that uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, will have, not only in the United States, but also overseas. It is, after all, one of the major works that will heavily influence many people in England and France and other places in Europe as well, even though England had uh, removed slavery earlier. Nonetheless, the book will keep most of the British people from a desire to help the South because of the evil institution of slavery that they saw as portrayed in Uncle Tom's Cabin. We then come to, instead of King Cotton, King Corn, and King Wheat, which proved to be far more formidable than King Cotton. This was because uh, Great Britain was in desperate need for food at the time. They were suffering through a drought, and they relied very heavily on imported food, especially from the United States, which came principally from the West, which sided with the North. So if they wanted to continue to feed their people, they needed to stay out of this conflict. And so it's one more reason why the British government will not join with the South in their struggle for secession. Then we come to the types of governments that will be used in this conflict. While we have seen that a Confederate type of government can be usable during a time of war, during the American Revolutionary War, it will function as our nation's government but it is nowhere near as efficient as that of a federal form of government. Under the Confederate government, you can appeal to individual states for aid, but they don't have to give it. In a federal form of government, the states must comply with federal laws, and there's no if, and, or but about it. The other is that even though the best of the infantry and cavalry went to the south, the best of the navy and the majority of the naval fleet will remain with the north. This is because most of the sailors and the officers in the United States Navy were from the north. While the South sent many of its sons to military schools to be trained as infantry and cavalry officers, the North will send their sons off to become sailors. And the Navy will prove to be an invaluable tool in keeping the South from being rearmed from Europe.
All right, with that, you can see that the North is going to win this conflict. All right, we'll end the lecture at that point and pick up again later. Thank you.